So it's recording now. So watch what you say. So since you can hear me, Bill, I presume that um, I'll be able to hear me as well. Yeah, it should be able to hear you as long as you're logging to go to meeting. Okay, so um, let me know when I should start recording. Will you record? Um, I'm already recording, Thomas. So, uh, Shravan, can you hear me? Oh, yes, but I can hear you. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, transfer control to Bill, you. Are you there? You can start presenting. Hmm. Just Thomas, can you hear me? Okay. No, we're not hearing anybody. No, we're not. Although we are seeing things. Hmm. Yeah, sorry. When we uh, turned on the projector, we got audio got switched, so we weren't hearing anybody. Okay. I think we should hear now. Sorry. You can hear now? Yes, we can hear from Okay. Okay, uh, Shravan, feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, so are you recording, Bill, quickly? Is yes, okay, you are. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so can you guys see the diagram that I'm sharing? Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, what Calix had proposed uh, a few months ago was uh, uh, Kafka integration application on Ono. Um, the whole idea was to export uh, internal Ono events to external applications uh, that may be running outside of uh, running in a separate VM or a separate machine outside of Ono context. And uh, so that external applications written in any uh, language, be it uh, Python, C, or C++, uh, can have access to stream event stream that, uh, that is continuously generated within Ono. Um, so, uh, so this is the architecture diagram that we had on the Ono wiki page. Um, uh, this shows the sequence of uh, interaction sequence between the external app and the Kafka server. Uh, so the external app uh, initially makes a register request uh, with the application. Uh, the register is a HTTP post request. Uh, and then subsequently, it does subscribe to a specific event type. At present, we support only device and link event. Uh, so once a application registers and subscribes, for an event, uh, the Kafka application starts listening for those specific event types. Uh, the event data that is uh, received from Ono is converted into GPV format, which is then uh, shipped to the Kafka message bus. The Kafka message bus has a separate topic for event type. So for device events, it has a separate topic. For link events, it has a separate topic. Uh, in the meantime, the external application registers itself as a consumer for Kafka uh, server and starts receiving these events, uh, unmarshals the GPB data, and uh, once you have the data, it, uh, it, it may be used for some other purpose. So this is a general overview of how the whole system works. Um, so I'll... Go ahead and start with the demo. If you guys don't have any questions. Um, um, here. Huh? Yeah, that's right. Hi. So I have Kafka application installed on Ono. Um, let me go to my. Uh, so I have Kafka running on uh, uh, Kafka and Onos running on uh, VM1. On VM2, I have my external application running. So 
So here I have two windows. Uh, I have uh, already brought up uh, mini night with couple of pictures and uh, a single link. I can show you what I have right now. This is what I have right now. And uh, I wrote a sample uh, external Python application, um, which basically interacts with the Kafka interact, uh, integration application. So what we'll do is we'll register with the Kafka integration application. So once you register the Kafka application, we get a UUID, which is the group ID, uh, which is used as a group ID when registering with uh, um, Kafka server. So I'll go ahead and start subscribing for events. So this Python app is a simple CLI based uh, Python app. Uh, so if I start subscribing, you will see that some of the events that were cached earlier um, got posted to me. Uh, so it gives you all the link event information along with the link source and link test. All this information has been uh, derived in GPP format and then unmarshaled. So I can bring the link down and see and you will immediately notice that the external app receives these email events. I can again bring it back up and you receive the events. Okay. Similarly, we can subscribe for device events. Um, actually, when I kill the app, it doesn't uh, terminate very cleanly. So I have to go ahead and uh, later if I want to subscribe. So this time I subscribe for device events. So you can see we get a number of uh, port stats updated events very frequently. Um, I can also bring a link up or down and you will see a port uh, going down. You can see port updated messages. So these ports, actually there is a port, under the port section there is a port is enabled field. Uh, so what is happening is on protobuf, uh, if, the, if there is a default value for an enum or any other object, it does not send that value when it serializes and sends it out. So the two-string implementation within Python uh, uh, sometimes does not print it. So if I bring it back up, You'll see the port uh, being updated. You'll see the ease enabled field, which tells you whether the port is uh, enabled or disabled. So this is what I have. Uh, any questions? Hey, this is uh, Joe Harrison at Windstream. Can you uh, describe a bit the availability features of, of this solution? Is it is it clustered? Yeah. So right now we do not support clustering, but. Uh, I have documented some of my uh, discussions with uh, uh, Madan uh, and on what we intend to do. Um, this is something we would like to contribute further. Right now, it does not support uh, work in a cluster environment. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. All right, any other questions? OK, 
Okay, great. Thank you very much, Travon. Appreciate uh, you doing the demo, and also really appreciate the uh, contributions um, in this area. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so up next is Jimmy. Jimmy's going to tell us about some of the optical enhancements that are made. So, Jimmy, I'll go ahead and transfer the presentation rights to you. Okay. So, show my screen. So, can you guys see my screen? I can. Okay. Okay, so basically, uh, before the demo, uh, we just have uh, one slide. Try to go, uh, give you an idea of uh, how do we uh, implement the, uh, the topology discovery feature for the Rodan uh, devices. Okay. So now, uh, as you know, in uh, optical network, uh, Rodan uh, switches the wavelengths. But the, typically, they don't terminate the light. They just uh, switch the wavelengths and uh, pass it on, right? So they basically don't talk to each other. Now, there's a standard called the uh, optical by the channel, uh, which is a standard wavelength. 15, 10 millimeters, and we put a uh, 100 megabit uh, Ethernet on top of uh, OC3 on that wavelength. So this makes the device talking to each other. So that is the infrastructure we support right now. Uh, so we basically rely on that infrastructure. We try to let the device talking to each other and report the connectivity to the uh, ONOS. So the ONOS topology as today, you know, for the optical network, all these links between the device are manually added. We, we like to have them discovered automatically. So that's the main idea. Now, over the uh, OSC, we actually transmit the TTIs. It's called the uh, trail trace identify specified by IQT standard, which basically inside this is you tell your neighbor uh, uh, what is uh, your device identify and also the port identify. So the na adjacent port will receive that uh, TTI. So once a uh, rodent receives the TTI from the uh, adjacency port, then we will use the open flow uh, protocol to send to ONOS. But the uh, typical open flow, like for one three, does not have optical support. However, uh, open network on published optical extension on open flow 1.3. So we rely on that the port adjacency message from that extension and the, the device will report the port adjacency to the open flow controller. And after that, we also wrote a uplink driver to process the port agency and inject the link to the uh, ONOS link service. So the link will show up like automatically. So that is the project. Now, the second part is we wrote a Rodem specific application uh, being the reason being that uh, the existing GUI they not customized like for the optical device, so we did uh, some uh, other layer of abstraction, so so it will show better uh, to the user for managing the optical device. But I don't have slides. We will see the demo straight for that part. Okay, so maybe let's go go to the demo. Uh, you guys have any questions? On the on the way uh, we are doing the topology. Okay, so let's go. Probably just go to the. Uh, so let me minimize this. So probably, so we will. Uh, so this is the. Uh, just on us and uh, official on us, we didn't change anything except we add a, a 
application on top of that for the optical device. So you can see there's a, a one device, right? Uh, it is, uh, we click on that device, and uh, uh, it, it is a loader, basically. We we put the open flow agent inside the, our device, then talk to Arnold's. Now, we are going to bring up the second device. You can see, it shows up. That's a refresh, it's a UI glitch. Okay. So, the link shows up, like a, by itself. So that is how, what is the main, the topology discovery. So hopefully in the future, when all the optical uh, device all supported this feature, then uh, topology will be discovered automatically. Right, okay. So uh, that that is the one part. Now these two links is a bi-directional, I mean, in the optical world, everything is bi-directional, right? So that they go one way. So that's why there's a two, two links. So we are going to load our GUI uh, partition. Yeah, the network, I don't know. It's, mm -hmm. it's trying. Okay. It's kind of slow. Okay. Now, uh, at the end, yeah. So we kind of uh, recustomize the two pages mainly. One is the uh, port page. If you can go back to the, the port page. Yes. So this is a, for each device, right? Uh, there's already existing pop-up window uh, in Arnos, but the, all the parameters are not really the, the optical device. It's more for switch and the ROMs. So in here, we, we kind of abstracted that what the, the uh, port uh, parameter applicable to the optical network. Then another enhancement is this page now is become editable. So meaning like for each optical port, you can set power to that, to each port. So it will feed, uh, ex uh, like uh, export the properly the power, uh, optical power to the next device, right? So that one. Now, the other page we, we enhanced, uh, kind of we did again, is the flow. This is the uh, wa uh, wavelength switching uh, feature. So we piggybacky on our open flow so, uh, and also customized the page uh, for two, two things. One is, again, the layout is more applicable to the uh, optical device specifically low them right now. And the secondary, uh, you can edit that table in two ways. One is you can add a connection. So probably we, we can try to add a connection. So from uh, port one, yeah, 15 to, to two, and use the wavelength number 33 and create the flow. So this request is going down to the uh, device. Now you see it has become state to become added, meaning the device is accepted that connection. So this is actually number 15 uh, input and outer port number two is the new connection just added, right? Now of course you can also delete a connection. Uh, by the way, the uh, existing uh, flow table is reader only, so we kind of made it and the right. That's what I think. Now, very similar to the port table, we can also just attenuation on this connection. So default is two two two, 
and uh, we can set it to a diff different value. For example, a transponder downstream will expect a certain power range. So we will set according to, to that. I think that's uh, pretty much we we did, right? That's pretty much right. Yeah. Okay. That's all for us. Any questions? And we will uh, put uh, this application into uh, try to check in uh, pretty soon in the next few days. So everybody, this is a very generic. As long as you implement the uh, standard uh, core behavior, then uh, all the disks can use the application to manage the, uh, their optical device. Yeah, that's all for us. I mean, uh, sorry, uh, Jimmy. Uh -huh. Hi, this is Abdul Hakim. Uh, I have a question because I'm actually working on something sort of. Uh, basically, it's uh, more about wavelengths, uh, uh, multiple wavelengths. Okay, if you mm -hmm. if you work with TDD and you're coming in on let's just say one single mode with four different wavelengths. Mm -hmm. Does account for it? Obviously, we need a splitter for those ports. They're going to split it to four ports, you know. And then, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does does this application accommodate? Uh, split yes. So this, uh, in our device, actually, we have a splitter two, one two seven. So the power will lower on the output. Oh, okay. Uh, this so this uplink this uplink device that you're using was it what is that is it called? It it is called the eight eight D loader. So basically, we can accommodate eight degrees. With okay. Heat. Yeah. Mm, okay. I, I probably we might have to set that up in the lab because we're having issues regarding. Uh, on the split side, we try um, AWG. We're not really getting anywhere. Oh, okay. Uh, we so, can't identify the wavelengths. It comes on a single fiber mode. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. yes. So this is what the problem is. It's okay if we, you know, we go four, you know, single modes, mm -hmm. plug it into the port, four in, four out. But it comes in as, as a single cable. And then that thing is actually being bundled. So we have to actually create a logic to unbundle, unbundle those wavelengths. I see, I see. And map them into four different ports, like one, two, three, four. OK. But in this kind of a more standard term, what type of device is this? Well, it's just standard. It's a TWDM, basically. What, what we're doing is experiment with it. OK. 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 It, it, it will. The, the more extra, mm -hmm. it will aggregate. It will aggregate four. I'm just giving an example. It will aggregate four single mode fiber. Mm -hmm. So it comes to the CEO on one single fiber now. Yes. Because so we we have to create a logic to the multiplex it. Yes. Or break it out, split it into four different cables to go into four different ports. Yes, exactly. That's what exactly, I mean, very, very similar we are doing, right? So, mm, okay. let's come one port, and we want mm -hmm. to the wavelengths to different ports outgoing wise. Exactly. Then, exactly. But yeah. the tricky part is, mm. the tricky part is, the, the multiplex cop comes in one port. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. out ports could go to different, four different ports. Yes. So, you've got to split or identify those wavelengths. And pass them back out to different directions. Yes, yes. You understand so there? Those the flow does right. So it uh, pick a wavelength from input port and send uh -huh. out the output port. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, can can you add though? Can you add? Let like, just say, um, in on one single port, mm -hmm. and let's just say. We've already broken the you know uh, broken the wavelength in four different wavelengths now. Let's just say A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. now, from those A, B, C, D, we've actually created a port. Mm -hmm. Let's just say uh, 
for a multi-tenanted. So yeah. carrier one mm -hmm. will get A and C. You yeah. understand? So take out A and C wavelengths and add it to the carrier one port. Yeah. You get you get my my uh, my drift now. Can yes. we'll we'll do that. That means add and subtract. Basically, that's what it is. Yes. It's just on the configuration side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Our device to do both way, right? So mm -hmm. max max. It's kind of in this term. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's that's yeah. great. I want to check out the uh, eight yeah. year old. Yes, you implement the uh, almost driver for your device, then this application can be reused for you guys to, to manage your device. Okay. Thanks, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, great. I uh, appreciate the demo. Optical uh, use cases are uh, really important. There's a lot of work that's going on with us in the IP and optical space. So I uh, appreciate your contributions there. Okay, um, Thomas or Brian, who's going to um, lead the next part of this? Uh, Thomas is going to share the slides. Thomas will? Okay, so um, Thomas, you are now presenter. Can you send it to me on that? Yeah. One, one moment, though. Uh, I'm just coming short of it. That's one. Can you see it? Wait, not this one. Is this the link wrong? Yeah, I think the link is wrong. It should be just the latest and not yeah. this one, yeah. Okay. That's good. Cool. So um, we're just quickly going to go through. Uh, Owen Labs participation, um, at least some of the features that have come out of Owen Labs over the past couple months. So we can go to the first slide. Uh, so the first one's and and uh, Madonna, if you're on the line, uh, you're, you're welcome to speak to this or I can speak to it. Uh, sure, I'm, I'm on the line. Uh, so it's, it's a quick update. update. Uh, so keeping with uh, you know our, our goal to make it easy to write uh, cluster distributed applications. Uh, in this release, we added a few more primitives uh, that we believe cater to uh, a different set of use cases. Uh, one of them is a tree map. Uh, again, shout out to Aaron from Fujitsu uh, who implemented this uh, particular primitive. Uh, the other one is a distributed topic. Uh, so, the one of the good things about this particular primitive is that this was something that was implemented in in a matter of a couple of hours. Uh, so that that shows that the work that we have done in the past releases in building a base for these primitives is is basically you know helping us out you know in, in extending this uh, by adding new features very easily. 
Uh, the third one is a verb queue, uh, which is uh, a distributed version of a producer consumer primitive. Um, you know, all of these are now available in, in the core. So anyone writing an application has a use case that might benefit from uh, having these kind of primitives, they are free to use those. Um, there are a couple of other, uh, I would say, improvements that were made uh, in the core. Uh, so the application store subsystem, which was previously relying on an eventually consistent map, has been migrated to use a consistent map, uh, which is in keeping with the semantics that are appropriate for that store. Um, and uh, similarly, we have done the same thing for component config store, uh, which was previously using an eventually consistent map, uh, which is now, uh, which now has been migrated to use a consistent map. Um, so these two features are, uh, are 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 available and then you know are part of this release. Uh, another feature that we implemented in this release is uh, this notion of a hybrid logical clock, uh, which provides a, a logical clock feature. Uh, for tracking causality and things like that. Uh, the benefit that this particular uh, feature provides is that this logical clock tracks NTP clock very closely. Uh, so anyone using this clock service, you know, they can they can reason about uh, the timestamps that are provided by this clock service and then relate them to real physical clock time. Uh, so that helps in debugging and various other things. Um, there's also some work done to uh, ensure uh, the alerts that are generated by the netconf alarm provider uh, are, are properly handed off to the core and so on. So there are some uh, enhancements that were made in, this, in that area as well. So all in all, those were the things that uh, that were made in the core part of Onos. Over to you, Brian. Oh, thank you. Uh, so the next uh, topic is some of the enhancements to the northbound. And so uh, one of the, the frameworks that we've seen a lot of uh, Feature improvements and enhancements, bug fixes uh, for this release has been uh, the event framework. So one of the, the big things we did was uh, the multi-point to single point and single point to multi-point intents now support multiple selectors or treatments uh, accordingly. And also the treatment is also being applied at the correct place. So the single point to multi-point is being applied on egress and multi-point to single point are having their treatments applied at ingress so that the uh, if there are packet modifications, those happen um, in a way that allows the, the traffic to be handled in a consistent um, consistent tree. Uh, and that, uh, we have a shout out to uh, Nick from Verizon uh, for helping with all of that work. Uh, we also um, introduced a preliminary back off mechanism for the intent cleanup subsystem. So sometimes if the system gets uh, overloaded, uh, it can get into a loop where intents get resubmitted uh, just because it's taking a long time to get work done. So we'll back off now uh, in that case. Um, and then we've also done some refactoring around optical compilers uh, to use the new optical information or newly refactored optical information model. Uh, on the host discovery side, we previously had a problem where multiple hosts, uh, especially in a DHCP environment, could be uh, discovered and bound to the same IP address. And so now what we'll do when a, a DHCP uh, lease has been reassigned to a new host because the old one went away or let it expire, uh, we'll make sure that um, the old hosts that did have the, the binding will get that IP removed from them. Um, this is yeah useful for, for um, proxy ARP and reactive forwarding um, or just general forwarding when you have uh, dynamic IPs. Um, and that was uh, Somia, one of uh, our summer interns, did that work. Um, we've also got some uh, initial work done on virtualization. And this is uh, Brian Sankey from Siena. Uh, worked with us to provide a uh, virtual topology provider as well as device and link services, uh, virtual device and link services, um, or virtual subgraphs. Um, this is some uh, investigative work that will feed into our uh, virtualization brigade this fall. And then finally, we've got initial support for uh, some gRPC-based um, external applications. And you already heard on this call about the Kafka-based app. So the next one um, is on the southbound side. And there were a number of new southbound enhancements uh, that we helped 
to review uh, both the design and code of. Um, but some of the, the contributions we made uh, were we added support for VLAN-based intents to the Corsa driver. For, uh, we have uh, alarms for NetConf notification, which also required some core support. Um, and right after GoldenEye, there was a, a fairly large refactoring of the BMV2 protocol module. Uh, and that was the work of Carmelo, uh, one of our co-ops, or I guess extended interns. Uh, on the application front, uh, there was a BMV2 demo app. So BMV2 is a behavioral model V2 software switch that implements P4. Um, this is this is crucial for getting uh, P4 ready for when we have some P4 hardware. Um, there were also a number of applications uh, that came in from partners and collaborators. Um, at least 10 new or existing applications that, that saw significant improvement. Um, and we were involved with uh, a lot of code review and design um, review for those applications. Um, maybe Simon can talk about the web UI? Yeah, so for the web UI, um, the, uh, with the regional web topology view being such a large chunk of work, uh, it continues to be work in progress. Uh, there's nothing really to show in this release, uh, but there's a lot of um, underpinning going on there. Um, the intent, flow, and group views on the UI were enhanced to um, implement a brief mode, which basically means that each line item has a summary line, um, and by clicking on a, a expand button, uh, you get more detail if you want to see it. But by default, it's, it's closed. You get more lines per, per screen. Um, on the intent view, also a, a, an action button was added to allow you to select an intent and, and um, submit a withdraw action to the server. Um, and then we've also been working on retheming of the icons, uh, working with a graphic designer to help us smarten up, uh, clean up the, the look and feel of the UI. Um, I would like to point out that the second and third bullet points were actually um, implemented by members of the community and not actually Owen Lab staff, so that was really gratifying to see. Uh, next, we can move on to some testing and build-related improvements. And Ray, maybe you can talk about the first two. Yeah, so our, STC is a tool we use to run a set of known topologies and behaviors through an installed ONOS instance. Uh, Thomas did a lot of work in terms of getting the cell integration to a nice place where we can fan out how many controllers we're going to use, we can fan out different topologies through uh, Mininet. And uh, some of the rest of us worked on improving the test coverage to include things like the config subsystem uh, to distribute primitives, um, some of the applications like the in particular, the OpenFlow application, and uh, loading and unloading of drivers. Um, part of this work involved some really sort of ruling debugging of really nasty edge cases that uh, we got a lot of a lot of really good nasty bugs fixed. So we were pretty happy with that. And then, yeah, we also saw. Us um, improved test coverage in a number of the subsystems, new tests for the primitives, uh, applications, uh, some drivers, and the config subsystem also was not tested prior to this release. So um, trying to drive that number up as well as improve stability. Um, we have an own Swagger plugin, um, which now generates the live Swagger REST bindings. Um, and this is both for Maven and Buck. Um, we have a new Onos tutorial VM that has sort of atrophied a bit since the Cardinal release, so that's been revived thanks to Luca's help, and that's uh, on the, the plan to maintain the sub, uh, subsequent releases. Um, a, a big change we've made uh, for Hummingbird is transitioning the build system away from Maven to Buck. Um, there's a lot of things that could be said here, but um, the, the highlight here is that uh, Buck is massively parallel, and Buck is also based on the hashes of files rather than timestamps, um, and it maintains artifact caches. So um, this has improved our build time from uh, you know over 10 minutes to just a few seconds, depending upon how many changes you make. Um, it feels a lot more like a make 
um, or an ant, then the sort of heavyweight Maven um, process. So um, hopefully that's something that people have noticed um, an under the hood uh, improvement. Um, <clears throat> the last thing, I don't know if you want to say anything, Bob, about Omnos.py. No, sir. I'm, I also be happy to give it just a short demo. Um, but we, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to develop on Onos. Uh, that is to say, to be able to uh, <clears throat> distribute distributed development, well, single instance and multi instance development on a laptop for both applications and core Onos development. And Onos.py supports that by uh, providing a usable controller class for Minidet. Uh, which allows a single MN command to start up an entire uh, model of those control those cluster, including uh, components of this control network as well. But basically, it's the easy, quickest, and easiest way uh, to get to run <coughs> uh, in particular, in particular, run multiple instances in a flexible way on your laptop. And uh, for for this release, uh, it works fairly reliably, but and we also have uh, a number of checks to check uh, for all the sorts of things that can go wrong. I'd be, I'd be happy to give a quick demo of it. Uh, in addition to onus.py, I also have an example of onus.py, uh, which is included where, which shows how to create uh, multiple onus clusters, each controlling a piece, separate piece of your network. So if we have time, I'd be happy to give a demo. Otherwise, uh, we can do a demo like at the sprint. Demo. I think we have a couple of minutes. Yeah, can I? That would be great. I don't know uh, how to share my screen on uh, GoToMeeting, but hopefully. You should get asked when uh, oh, okay. you get. Great. Oh, yeah. Great. Share my screen. There it is. Oh, my gosh. Terrific. Okay. So, um, so the nice thing about uh, so this stuff five is included uh, in. Uh, in the Onus source tree, Onus tools that many nets, you always know you're getting the correct version that works with this current version of Onus. And it's, it's very easy uh, to sudo and then it invokes many net, but it's, it's just, it uses what's called custom file to extend uh, <coughs> many nets functionality custom Onus apply, and now we can use specify Onus as a controller drive. Controller Onus, and Onus comma 3 will actually have a three instance Onus cluster. Specify topology in this case will make, say, a torus. With returns and to start it up. And um, so the interesting thing to keep in mind is this is a single line kind of end to end uh, system test, really using Onus. And you can also use Minidet's test feature to invoke, uh, invoke system tests within a single line. So the idea, or sort of my goal, and also, um, also John Hall, who's been working with me on this, is to make it easier for Minidet developers to run end to end system tests. Just as part of your regular, uh, or Onus developers run end-to-end -end system tests uh, in Minidet, just as part of your regular uh, development process. So here we're starting in Onus, and we're starting up actually in sort of three Onuses, and it seems to be taking a while, but that's just because Onus takes a while to start up, and uh, we're checking to check uh, if any of the things are going wrong, like, oh, is, is Carafe not started? Is SSH port not, is Carafe not listening on its SSH port? Is OpenFlow not started? Uh, can we not talk to Carafe? Is the node status bad? Like, did some apps not load or something? We check that on all three nodes, and we're good to go. And so, uh, if we the nice thing that Onus.py provides is automatic port forwarding. So even though Onus is running on a Minidet host inside of VM, it automatically forwards the ports to ports 8181. The GUI ports, for example, ports 8181, 8182, and 81 uh, just sort of sequentially up, so we can connect to it. And we should see the topology. And so the interesting thing here, a couple things, when you see the forest topology. Uh, so uh, we notice that we're actually, we have three Onus nodes. Uh, and we're, oh, it's a zero device, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, but we're connected. Oh, they're all on the Oh, they're all on the So what's going on? Let's see. So going back to uh, the terminal, we can, uh, here we can do actually do something rather, rather interesting. We can just type, uh, so we're at the mini app problem. It's actually a hybrid mini app. Uh, Mini prompt, so uh, we can actually drop it in on us prompt to just type commands in on us. Uh, what is it called? It's a balance host. Is it? Well, from the UI, you can just hit the E key for equalize masters. Yeah, you can do that too, but I just wanted to show you. Show sure. So um, I can actually, you know, we can show, uh, what is it, on us nodes, I guess, to show the list of nodes that we can 
Yeah, it depends. Makes it pull back, back into the community. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so Simon said, of course, the easy way of doing it, which is easy to get the EP, but um, let's see, how do I see the modeling? I don't know. Um, yeah, just click, click again. Click there we go. And so we see the little computer saying that we're connected to the first on us, but we could actually connect to the second one as well. Um, let's see, it's got a different port. And, so you say the devices, that's nice. Um, so in, we've customized, we've added a few commands like ARP to do send out gratuitous ARPs. And so if we, once we do this, we should see all the hosts here. And there they are, there are all the hosts. So as you can see, this is just sort of a, a very simple way to create an OS cluster with parameterized. We can actually specify the, uh, the control network topology and the number of OS hosts in it. So I have one more thing I'd like to, ooh, I don't know, I still have a virtual box here. Uh, one more thing I'd like to show you very quickly, and that is uh, kind of running multiple ONUS clusters in a single VM. Uh, these clusters are, for my, my purposes today, they're going to be degenerate clusters. This is going to be one node. You can actually run like two, uh, two three node clusters. So looking at examples, I have this multi-cluster up. I want to show it to you quickly because it's very, it's very easy actually how it works. Um, you just create two control network topologies, an east network and a, and a western network. Then we create two ONUS clusters using those topologies, east for east topo with east topo and west with west topo. We specify their IP address ranges, and we have to we have to name their NAS so that they don't conflict in the namespace. And we set up a data network topology, create our mini-net network. We assign switches to controllers. Uh, we're using switches, uh, this multi-switch, which basically just explicitly assign a controller using, uh, using mini-net to switch that controller equals uh, East of its uh, in the left in the lower half of the switches, west of its in the upper half. You can use whatever metric you want. Uh, start a uh, and start a network. You run on a CLI, which is the hybrid mini on a CLI, and then set the network down. So I'll show you. Uh, so we'll just run this in script. And so what we're going to do is we'll create uh, our east on us cluster and our west on us cluster. Um, start them, create our data network, we'll start up our east cluster, we'll start up our west cluster. Uh, all the switches are assigned to, are assigned to connect to the appropriate, uh, appropriate on us, and we'll actually look at the GUI and see what happens there. Once again, we're checking on all the things that can go wrong when on is starting up. The on us uh, CLI also has a status command that basically will look through the log for you and tell you if there are warnings or errors. So, if things are going bad, the ONUS CLI, or ONUS, or sorry, MiniNet, ONUS CLI uh, can tell you uh, at a glance sort of uh, if there's bad stuff going on in your log. So hopefully this is sort of, maybe it won't start up, maybe Craft will go. Sometimes Craft doesn't start up and it's really, it's good to know. Uh, it doesn't actually time out, I think it'll just wait forever. So perhaps not starting up for reasons unknown. People wait a little bit longer. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know why perhaps not starting up. We could, uh, but we could, we could actually look at the uh, look at the log. Let's see. West West one. West one. And I don't know, it looks, it looks okay, it's just doing the same thing, so let's take a look. Yeah, so for reasons... Starts how long and starts some applications or something? Yeah, could be. But Craft is, uh, Craft is not listening on its port, so Craft is not completing its service. It's already. Yeah, Craft's not ready, so... Uh, we could, just, we could just start again. Try that. Try it one more time. But the nice, nice thing about uh, having these tests is it's easy to run them, and uh, it's easy to run them a whole bunch of times and uh, see when things don't start up and hopefully diagnose the problem. So, like I said, the kind of goal of NS.py is to um, is to make it easy for developers to run end-to-end -end system tests just as part of their environment. He seems to be starting up, but um, 
was started up this time. So craft, basically craft didn't complete its startup sequence the first time. And I'm not sure why. But at least you know where it's hanging, which is good to know. So we should be able to look at three. So we can talk, we can look at both of these from the GUI. So in this case, now 8181 is going to be uh, is going to be, I think, east. And so uh, we'll see, let's see, those one, two, three, four, five. And west is going to be the you know, next one. Or maybe it's the other way around, I'm not sure. But the interesting thing is now that now we ping, if we ping things, uh, each of us, since uh, we're using just the uh, reactive forwarding and OS is pretty much configured as Ethernet bridge, Ethernet bridges are transparent. So uh, we'll see put something interesting, which is that we have connectivity across both, have both halves of the network, even though each half is being controlled by <coughs> But the interesting thing is that all the uh, all the nodes on the foreign network appear as if they're connected to this one switch because this Ethernet bridging is transparent. So we see in this case, this is on one side, so we have like one, two, three, four, yeah. and then on this side. So this is just an example of uh, you know how with a single laptop, single VM, you can actually create kind of a federated ONUS environment and, uh, and test it out. So I encourage everyone to try out ONUS stuff by trying multi cluster, and uh, you know drop us a line if uh, if you have success or failure, and feel free to submit pull requests and bug reports. Cool, that's it for me. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, great. I think with that, it's back to you, Bill. Okay, that was a really cool demo, Bob. Thanks. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. That's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brian Thomas for taking us through um, all of the other items. Okay, right, and uh, I have I have nothing uh, left to uh, present at this point, and so I'll just open it up. If anybody else has any other questions or any other comments, there were a couple of questions in the chat. Bill, Let's get us started. Okay. Uh, they were both about optical discovery and Rotom GUI parameters. Joe Harrison had one and Bob had one. I think, uh, I think my question was, was answered in the presentation. Okay. Um, does any, anybody have an answer to Joe's question? Uh, let me see. The, how do I see the chat? Oh, okay. It says, uh, are all the Rotom GUI parameters configurable through the API? Yes. So uh, right now we use uh, all standard service. For example, the uh, flow service from the Onos. Then also for the power configuration and the Lambda, we use the uh, behavior API, standard behavior API. So for a company interested in this uh, application, you can implement those two drivers, then it will just work. Great. Thank you. OK. Anything else? All right. OK. Well, thank you everyone for joining. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, thank you all the presenters for the, the contributions. Appreciate it. All right, so I'll go ahead and stop recording and we'll go ahead and end the meeting. Bye-bye.